Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the VMI Leader Journey. My name is Major Catherine Roy, and I will be your host for a conversation with retired Lieutenant General Gwen Bingham. In this episode, we've titled, Does Your Audio Match Your Video? Bingham is this year's been for JHP Leader in Residence. The VMI Center for Leadership and Ethics hosts this program and produces this podcast to educate, engage, and inspire the VMI Corps of Cadets, the greater VMI community, and listeners like you. Bingham's visit coincides with this year's leadership theme titled Citizen Leaders. During our conversation, Bingham said that she believes leaders should communicate, coordinate, and collaborate. But which one of these does she believe is the most important? Let's listen in to find out. Welcome, Lieutenant General Gwen Bingham. Thank you for agreeing to uh, join us for the podcast today. Thank you so much, Catherine. It's a joy to be here with you on such a beautiful fall day. Yes, it is a beautiful <laughs> day. We'd like to know a little bit about your background. Okay. Um, so if you could tell us you know, what rank you last had and a little bit about your, your leadership journey. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, well, first, uh, let me just say that uh, I am an Army brat. Uh, so I'll begin with that. Uh, I am the proud daughter of an Army, retired Army first sergeant and his bride, my mom. Uh, I l was born in Troy, Alabama, as was my dad, uh, who moved shortly after I was born to his duty station at Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, we lived there for 10 years and then moved to Fort Sam Houston for another three years. So all totaled, I lived in Texas 13, my first 13 years growing up. Uh, he retired, moved back to Alabama where I went to high school and college. And then my duty stations over the years took me back to Fort Hood, Texas, wearing, uh, with my own ID card, wearing my own uniform for another six plus years. So all total about 20 years in Texas. So I like to sort of begin to, to say that I have Alabama roots and I also have Texas roots. I came into the Army um, on a four-year Army ROTC scholarship. Um, I believe that I would fulfill that obligation with four years and not a day longer, as I like to say. And uh, oops, something happened along the way, Catherine. I like to tell people I fell in love, not only with the man I met and married now 38 years ago this month, but I fell in love with this vocation called the U.S. Army, and I've been the better for it. And, and so my first uh, lesson, if there would be, would be to uh, leaders out there, young leaders, to never say never, because you just might be surprised and, and fall in love with something that really becomes your passion. And you'll know it's your passion when it doesn't feel like work. And that's just sort of a good indication of that. So I've been in the Army uh, before I retired. I came in, as I said, for four and, and ended up staying 38 and some change. And uh, now my husband and I live out uh, just outside of Austin, Texas, and have been retired now for just over two years. So it's been great. Well, congratulations for such a long and wonderful career, as well as your upcoming anniversary. Yes, thank you so much <laughs> on the 19th. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, what was it, would you say, that you fell in love with in the Army? So yeah. as our cadets listen to this, you know, what might they expect from a career in the Army? Yeah, that's a great question. And when I say fell in love, I literally mean that. I have really come to appreciate that I'm a people person. Um, my dad, uh, and, I, and, and, and let me regress a little bit just to say I'm the I figured out I'm the perfect combination of both my mom and my dad. Um, my dad never met a stranger. People loved him. Uh, he, he, he was just very people-oriented. Uh, my mother was a very devout Christian woman, uh, raised us five children, and uh, she taught us the golden rule, treat others the way we would want to be treated, and she taught us a love of God and a love of fellow man. And so throughout my our household and and throughout my growing up, that was kind of foundational and fundamental to kind of who I am. So the combination of, of trying to be a good Christian and also being a people person really is what ended up keeping me in the Army and really helping me find my passion. Over the years, I've just really 
um, had such a strong desire to get to know people, particularly people who didn't look like me. I was always in fa fascinated and enchanted with people of all races, all cultures, uh, ethnicities. The more different we seemed to be, the more it just really drew me to wanting to have an appreciation of who that person was. And I think that's what I really found inside the military was not only the opportunity to, to learn and grow, but the opportunity to get to know people who were my battle buddies on my left and battle buddies on my right um, that I that would really become not only teammates but also good friends over time. And so just that strong pull and love for uh, being a part of something bigger than me as an individual. And I like to use the acronym for team that I, I've heard it said before, team together, everyone achieves more. And I really do believe fundamentally that's how we achieve um, mission successes. And no matter whether you're in the military, uh, like I stayed a part of my dad before me, for he was in for 20 plus years, or you find um, work elsewhere. I think it's uh, incredibly important to be able to have this sense of working together as a team where you are accomplishing not only what you are told to do individually, but you're also adding to the greater good of that team, that corporation, that organization that you are affiliated with. Sounds like you had a very strong sense and um, found a lot of joy in servant leadership. Would that be... That's, that's, that's probably very accurate, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have described it that way at the time so many years ago. Um, but what, I'm, um, you know, is what, what I get a high on uh, is truly um, plugging into a new organization, finding it at one level, and then being able to do my part as a leader to grow that organizational, uh, organization incrementally to a higher level of success. So when I talk to you about Joanne Dunwoody's book, A, a Higher Standard, I, I think about you know, a higher standard in terms of finding an organization and, and taking it to the next level of excellence as, as a goal and something ultimately that we can do, again, working together as a team. How would you say that your people first focus helps accomplish that mission? Yeah. I had a boss who once told me many, many years ago, and it was so profound at the time he told me, I've, I've never forgotten it. And he said to me, he says, Bingham, he says, you can have all manner of ribbons and awards and ribbons on your chest. And he said, that's good. He said, but at the end of the day, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And I've never forgotten that. And if you think about even your own life's style and, and perhaps your walk of life, um, you just want to understand that somebody cares about me as an individual. Uh, they see me as an individual and they have a desire for me as an individual to be successful, one, and, and, and more importantly, to grow. I always liken it to I'm trying to work myself out of a job. So if I've been the commander of an organization, um, I'm looking to coach, teach, train, mentor young people to follow me one day and to share some of the uh, challenges I've had along the way and to uh, strengthen them for times that will be challenging because it's not a matter of if you will be challenged, it's when those times will come. So that kind of leads to me to another question that I wanted to ask you about or get your feedback on is the role of uh, sponsoring, mentoring, and being a champion. It sounds like if you're nurturing those relationships, I would think that if somebody was investing in me that way, it would inspire me to work harder because you see the uh, potential affirm affirmation of mm -hmm. your efforts, you're being recognized. Um, but can you talk a little bit about that mentorship, a champion, yes. people and sponsoring people? Yes, and I th it's a great question. And, and there are differences between each of those roles, sponsors, champions, advocates, mentors. And not to really get uh, too much in the technical aspect, aspect of the differences, but if I, as your leader, as a leader, 
it's my responsibility to train you. It's my responsibility to give you good leadership, to help you maintain uh, your equipment, and to train you and to care for you and sustain you and your family. As a leader, to me, that's fundamentally what I get paid to do. And whether or not that's um, true or false, that's what I, Gwen Bingham, have accepted that role and I, I enjoy that role. And to that end of uh, coaching, teaching, training you, mentoring you to be your better self, to grow, to learn, and to get to the next levels, I'm going to do what I can do to put you in a position where one, you can achieve success, and two, you can learn and grow. That's fundamental, that's foundational, and that's very, very important. Sometimes I've seen where leaders miss the boat, subordinate leaders, um, they have a, a set um, group of people that they, you know, this is my top, you know, my top guy or my top gal, and I'm going to focus on just them. Well, you miss the masses when you only focus on the people that are already strong horses, so to speak. You want to get to really the bowels of your organization and bring up everyone to another level of growth and professional uh, growth such that the whole organization is then lifted up to a high level of performance. As a mentor, and uh, I often found that counseling my direct reports, I ask my direct reports to counsel their subordinates, et cetera, et cetera. And so I owe you written feedback, I owe you verbal feedback. In the military, particularly the Army that I grew up in, it was a requirement that you gave quarterly mentoring. You had quarterly mentor or um, counseling sessions where I tell you, hey, here's in my observations of your performance, here's your strengths, here's your areas that are deficient, and here's a strategy that I would offer for you to improve those deficiencies. And we'd have a conversation. Uh, it, it just can't be one way. It's got to be um, a two-way dialogue. The person I'm counseling, my, my subordinate, has to feel comfortable being able to share with me what his or her concerns are, or questions that they might have. Because at the end of that, what you're doing is you're building a relationship. And the most critical aspect of building a relationship is a short five-letter word that begins with T. And I think you probably know, Catherine, what that is. It's trust. If I can't trust you and you can't trust me, our relationship is really not going anywhere. It, it just won't. But if you trust me and you listen to what I have to say and you accept what I have to say in terms of how I'm observing you as a, as a subordinate, and you make those changes, it can be really uh, fulfilling and gratifying just to see your own self growing to that next level that we're both aiming for. Here at VMI, we have what's called the VMI Leader Journey, mm -hmm. and it's VMI's system for developing the cadets uh, as they are here throughout their four-year career. Mm -hmm. One of the things that they, one of the values that they have is trust along with fairness. So it sounds to me like maybe fair, being fair as you're doing regular feedback with mm -hmm. your folks, giving them not only the critiques and the observations, but you're also giving them some advice. Here's how you can improve. Right. That that probably has a big role in, mm -hmm. in developing that atmosphere of trust. Yeah. And, and that's a great point. And to that point, there's no one size fits all. I mean, what I tell you, Catherine, uh, could be different than what I tell Bobby or Susie, um, be, because you might be both at different stages of your professional development. And so it's, there's no one size fits all. Um, nothing beats failure but a try, and I always tell people try. Uh, if at first you don't succeed, you know, just keep trying because that you will find success uh, eventually. And I think um, really that give and take, that communication 
is just so critical. I, I can't underscore how uh, a subordinate must feel empowered and must feel that there's enough trust between he and his supervisor that he can really share um, what's truly on his mind, his or her mind, because without that, again, you don't have a relationship that's uh, long lasting for sure. Uh, changing topics a little bit, um, this year's center's theme and VMI's theme of mm -hmm. leadership is citizen leaders. You talked a lot about how you spent a career in the military, which is an obvious role for someone who wants to be a citizen leader. And then we talked a little bit about the VMI journey. We have what's called the three-legged stool. So mm -hmm. it's the whole person development, uh, the academics, the military training, um, and the, um, the physical training. What is your advice then to young people on what competencies, skills, and behaviors they ought to develop now uh, to maximize their potential as future citizen leaders? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, gosh, Lee, we could talk a long time probably about uh, that question. I, it was funny because um, when, I'm, when I crossed over to the general officer ranks, I had so many people ask me, to what do you attribute your successes to? And um, first and foremost, I give thanks to God for uh, just really all that he has enabled me to be, see, and do. I give thanks to my, my husband, my, our two kids, our extended families, and I'm so grateful for so many, many people whose paths have crossed mine uh, because you just cannot achieve success by yourself, lest you fool yourself. And so that would be my first uh, thought is to be grateful and to show and share gratitude with the people who are, have helped you along your own journey. Probably begins with your, your parents or your caretakers, your significant others, uh, perhaps even. Uh, be, just begin every day with an attitude of gratitude, and I think that would be my first and foremost thought. I think it's uh, vitally important to have a positive attitude um, and, and on my Bingham's top 10 plus four, I think that's the first uh, one of my, my top 10 is to have a, keep a positive attitude because I think a positive attitude will take us all one half the distance. And I know it's just important. As I look back on my 38 year journey, I think it really at the end of the day uh, speaks to being competent as well as having confidence. Those two are important because if you want to be a leader, no matter whether you're in the military or outside the, the military, you have to have both. You have to be competent and you have to have confidence in yourself. Otherwise, you're not gonna get others to follow you anywhere. And I would think uh, another one would be empathy. I think you need to have empathy for uh, humanity, just in general terms. Uh, you don't know the walk of life that people come from. There are people who uh, come from um, backgrounds uh, that are different from ours. There are people that come from good homes, broken homes, have been uh, products of abuse, etc. And so not knowing that is to be empathetic with all whom you have the opportunity to associate with. And I use the, the three C's, communicate, coordinate, and collaborate. You need to be good at all three of those. But the one that com I keep coming back to, Catherine, is probably you need to be a collaborator and you need to get good at it because collaboration is probably the most, uh, the strongest of those three C's. Communicate is important, being having the ability to coordinate but strategically to get where you want to go, you need to be able to collaborate because again, you uh, and I can't do it by ourselves. And I often talk about partnerships uh, that kind of goes hand in hand with that collaboration that's so vital in our society today. How would you collaborate? Um, in other words, do you have a, 
a method for collaborating? Do you have a way of identifying people who would be key mm -hmm. members at the table, so to speak? That's a great question. Um, I think it uh, begins with a recognition of the talents of the individuals sitting around the table or inside of your, of your small, your team, your, your greater organization. Uh, it's, a, it's an ability to recognize the strength that each one has. That's number one, because everybody uh, brings something to the table. You often, as a leader, might have to figure that out and find out what their strength is. Uh, but the beauty about being a part of something greater than yourself as an individual is recognizing the strengths that uh, individuals bring and have, and then being able to take those talents, skills, and strengths and use them in a way that's collaborative in effort and then helps to produce the outcome uh, that you're ultimately trying to achieve. And it's just, it's just been fascinating to me over the years to, and, and that brings me back to the people person that I am because I enjoy getting to know people. And so you, you can't be hands off about the people in your organization. Uh, some people grapple with that because they uh, have more of an introvert personality. I, I'm probably extrovert, extraordinaire. <laughs> I got that from my, my dad, but um, it's the, uh, uh, doesn't know a stranger, that know a stranger right? <laughs> I just a desire to get to know people. But once you understand uh, who you have sitting inside of your organization or inside of your team and understand their strengths, it just is fascinating to see how those uh, you can work the strengths to achieve your greater goal. Oh. Um, you mentioned that you've got like Bingham's top four. Top, top ten, 10 plus four. Can you share those with us? <laughs> yeah, well, um, so Bingham's top ten plus four, I guess I made um, general officer in 2010. I came out on the promotion list for, for one star. And so many people were asking me, again, you know, to what do you attribute your success? And I really started giving it some, some thought. I took a couple of weeks, and, and at the time, David Letterman was, you know, popular on, on uh, nighttime TV. So I fashioned it after, you know, Bingham's top, top 10. 10, right, <laughs> the, after David Letterman's. And the plus four, just four of the nuggets that I've come across uh, as I was uh, executing or, you know, living my journey. But uh, stay positive is the first one on there. Uh, the second one is do the best job you can, no matter the job. Uh, there is no such thing as a bad job, and I truly believe that, and we could probably talk a day about that. Seek the tough jobs is third. Work productively every day. Learn your craft well and read. Um, the fifth one is be a team player 24-7. Uh, the sixth one is be relevant and value added to every team you're part of. And that's critical, and I won't, I'll just go through these, and you can talk about any of them if it piques your interest. The seventh one is maximize your opportunities to diversify your portfolio. In other words, broaden your job skills and attributes via broadening assignments. So whether it's broadening assignments inside the military or you're taking on tangible jobs that are related outside in a different um, uh, walk of life, I think you should do that. The more broad we are, the better we can perform across the board. And uh, number eight is keep yourself physically, mentally, and spiritually fit. The ninth one, which I love, is build relationships and sustain them. That's a key, and I, I hope you'll ask me something about that. And then the tenth one is remember the golden rule. Do unto others the way that you want to be done unto and treat everyone with dignity and respect. So that's my plus, my top 10. And how about your plus four? My, my plus fours, okay, do the right thing even when no one is looking. Your audio must match your video. Oh, that's good. That's another one we should talk about. Uh, the, the, the 11th or the second plus four is nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think we just mentioned that. And then the third one was, we are public servants. Be proud, yet humble, always, because I think humility is a good thing. 
And then the plus four, the fourth one of that is exercise, professionalism, and sound judgment on social media venues. Oh, goodness. <laughs> we could talk a long time. We could talk that. a long time about that. So there you have it. I think that goes with the uh, audio matching your video, too. Exactly. Like, yes, we'll talk a second about that, the audio. Yeah. Video. Yeah. So uh, there was a Raisian Cajun three-star general named Lieutenant General Russ Honore. Oh, yeah. Remember him yes, yes. Uh, during the hurricane? And, and um, he really was just a phenomenal uh, general officer. I didn't know him well, but when I was state first assigned at Fort Hood, Texas, he was the first cavalry division's ADCS, uh, assistant division commander for sustainment. And he was given a professional development uh, session with uh, young leaders and he, I just remembered him making the comment, he says, your audio don't match your video. <laughs> and aside from the fact he had a funny voice, I thought about what he was saying. In other words, I can't tell a soldier, as an example, to do physical training and get up at six o'clock in the morning and do physical training if I'm laying in the rack myself. It doesn't compute. In other words, my audio doesn't match my video. So what I'm telling you to do doesn't match what I'm doing. And I never forgot it. That was probably 1992, 95 when he had that position. So that several years later in 2000 when I became a battalion commander at Fort Lee, I started using that and I, and I attributed it to him having heard it first from him. Your audio must match your video. And so uh, that speaks volumes. And it really sort of serves as a North Star to guide my own um, what I say and what I do. And so I'll, I'll plant that one with you this morning uh, with the thought that when we tell subordinates to do something, we must be willing to do it ourselves uh, lest our audio doesn't match our video. Mm. Yeah, I call that walking the talk. Walking the talk, absolutely. <laughs> that and, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, you win the respect of your subordinates when they see that you're willing to do what you tell them to do. And the leadership course, they also point that out or highlight that under lead, lead by example. Exactly. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, and then talk a little bit about the building and sustaining relationships. You know, you talked yes. about how you're a relationship kind of person, mm -hmm. empathy, building trust. But the sustaining relationships, yeah. I think, is something we haven't touched on. Yeah, that's key. And I often liken relationships to flowers. And what must you do with flowers? You must water them ever so often lest they die, right? And so relationships are kind of like that. Uh, once you establish a relationship or build it, you want to sustain that relationship because eventually that's going to go hand in hand with that collaboration that I'm talking about. So as young cadets here, as you get to know your fellow cadets, you know, across your academic uh, uh, subjects or across sports, if you might be in a sport, uh, it's a good thing to not only establish but to build and build upon that relationship because you just never know one year, two year, three years from now, you might be teaming up with that person in another role here even at the, at the uh, institute. And for sure, out inside the military and even outside the military, as I am retired now over two years, I've been able to uh, have people that I've known either, you know, 40 years ago in the Army or uh, that I've met just recently over the last couple of years and be able to use those uh, formative relationships to uh, collaborate and partner. And I think that's so vitally important. Yeah, we like at the um, annual leadership conference, that's open to a general audience, and we mm -hmm. invite a lot of schools to come here for that very reason. The networking for our exactly is not just about them um, learning the arc of the content that we have, but it's also about them building relationships with folks who may not commission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so being because they may have to work with them one day. Uh, so exactly. So that is 
Yeah, it's, it, it often comes sooner than even you realize that it might even peak its head to where it's just, you know, you, 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 you look out in an audience you, and you go, oh, that's so-and-so from, you know, one year ago or five years ago. Uh, those times will come and they come more often than you, you, you think. I've had a number of uh, former or, or officers who have said, you know, come back to me and said, you know, ma'am, I'm, I find myself in a uh, challenging uh, predicament right now, can you help? And if we've continued that relationship over time, I can attest to, you know, Johnny, Bobby, or Susie's performance and be able to help lend credibility to whatever predicament or situation they find themselves in. I've had a number of folks who have said, hey ma'am, I'm, I'm retiring out of the Army, will you be a resource and a reference for me? And I, Absolutely, I'll be happy to do that for you. And so, um, a lot of times it's just, you know, like those kinds of examples. Uh, but then again, you know, you might be working in, an, and um, I'll tell you this, literally, uh, when I was interviewing for my first uh, role sitting on a board, and um, I was um, asked by um, a friend of mine, would you be interested in, in considering uh, this role? And I said, well, sure. And really the friend was, had become more of a mentor to me and uh, was really probably the driving force for me at least getting a seat at the interview table uh, to uh, be able to uh, interview well for the, for the position. So again, just being able to sustain those types of relationships is key. Uh, but I think the optimum word is build them, but then sustain them. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah, that seems very important. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, um, some of your thoughts about being relevant. That was in your top 10 plus four. Yeah. Being relevant, I guess, where you're planted or where, yeah. you know, within whatever roles you may have. Well, that's a good uh, follow on. And Catherine, when I talk about being relevant and value added, and I think those two kind of flow together, and that's the way I use them in my, in my top 10. Um, being relevant and value added to every team, because if, you're not, if you don't or if you're not, it, it, it's kind of like someone told me another acronym, NFL is not for long. <laughs> <laughs> you will be off the team pretty quick if you're not relevant and value added to a team. I mean, think about it, we're in the football season, that's kind of apropos. Yes. But um, it's, it's being able to lend assistance to your team. Together, everyone achieves more, kind of that acronym. Mm -hmm. And it's the thought of you uh, really not necessarily showcasing in a braggadocious way your talent, but certainly owning your talent. And when you see that your teammate is faltering, um, you know, being able to lend assistance. And that's what we, when I talk about being relevant and value added, is someone who takes the initiative uh, to do work that we all know needs to get done, or they have a talent that is, is formidable. And um, let's just say you, you, you don't, or you do go in the military or not, and you speak a foreign language. And you are around uh, a, a number of dignitaries who, uh, like within my first few years, I was around uh, Koreans. I was stationed in Korean, Korea. And uh, being able to speak the language, uh, that's an added uh, relevancy oh, yeah. uh, that would be critical, mm -hmm. um, both in and outside of the military. So it's really using your, your talents that you, you have and then growing that talent base to other skill sets and competencies that lend themselves to be good for the team and the greater good of the organization. I've read, I can't remember the book I read now, but um, it talked about having skills in other disciplines. Mm -hmm. And then it gives you a way of thinking or problem solving that within your industry or sector might be uncommon. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're working, you know, in a STEM type job, mm -hmm. but you had a humanities background, how you bring your language skills perhaps to that job mm -hmm. can add a nice layer of um, professionalism or polish on a project working in what we call that band of excellence. Yeah, and that's such a good uh, 
description as you've laid it out too, because I, I think that's what I talk about when I, when I say do the best job that you possibly can do and there's no such thing as a bad job. I also talk about um, broadening and broadening your, your skill set and the way that you do that is either because you took on a second major or a minor, uh, as they call it in my day, um, to, but it's at the end of the day, what you're really trying to do is broaden your own job skill sets uh, that lend, um, again, that relevancy and value to the organization to what you're assembled. Uh, if, if, if you were to look at my biography, I'm a logistician by trade. I came through the ranks of quartermaster, which is supply. Um, but at some point, like for instance, my command, my company command, uh, was not in a supply and service company. It was an automated data processing detachment. Now think about that. Mm -hmm. Here I am, a quartermaster supply, uh, commanding an automated data processing detachment. We had so many technicians that were computer geeks. and I mean, they were <laughs> strong at it. And um, I was responsible for the mission supporting um, a logistical command for automated data processing. Well, uh, I felt like a fish out of water, but I used the skills of connecting with the people who were um, technicians in that area and very skilled at it. And oftentimes you'll find yourself, as I like to say, burning the midnight oil to get myself up to speed. So you do a lot of reading, you do a lot of on-the-job training, mm -hmm. and it's okay. I would tell anybody if you find yourself in a in a job or position that you are not totally qualified technically for, that that's like on the job training. And so you go after it by taking what you are very good at, which is leading people, mm -hmm. uh, and then learning the technical aspects of those different kinds of jobs and positions. What I think was so uh, uh, key for me was I love learning. I love learning new things. I love, I'm an adventuresome person, just in, in, in general, so I like going to different places. Mm, and sounds like a sense of fearlessness, too, <laughs> that you don't mind tackling new and strange things. Yes, well, I'll give you a case in point, White Sands Missile Range. Um, after my first assignment as a general officer, as a quartermaster general at Fort Lee, uh, I was assigned to go out to Fort or White Sands Missile Range, which is outside of Fort Bliss, uh, but it's in New Mexico. Mm. It is the uh, Department of Defense's largest land uh, range, and we do testing there, all kinds of like missile tests, et cetera. And um, 3,200 square miles of just opportunities, as I like to call it. <laughs> I was working with Army, Air Force, Navy primarily, and um, we had a lot of uh, institutions like NASA would come and train, Defense Threat Reduction Agency would come and test there. Mm -hmm. And I, I just felt like a kid in a candy store. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was asked before I got there to be a keynote speaker for a space conference. Well, I knew nothing about space other than, you know, one stall, small step for man and one <laughs> giant leap for mankind, right? And so again, I went to ground and, and did a little bit of homework and figured out what White Sands had done for decades and, and it uh, pulled it off with the help of my people, uh, put together a series of uh, visuals, audio visual clips of the actual tests and so the audience was dazzled because they said, oh, I remember that. Mm -hmm. And so it just, it was a big hit. But the, the point was is that I probably going there was about 60-40. 60% I was very, very comfortable with, and 40% I wasn't. Right. And um, it didn't take me long to uh, narrow that gap to down to something that was negligible in terms of my, uh, my experience base and capabilities. But that's the beauty of the team, and I keep going back to that. Um, together, everyone achieves more. So being not afraid to get out among your people in the organizations who are the experts and letting them help coach and teach me, as was the case, about what we did. It was just fascinating work, and I just enjoyed every minute of it. I actually uh, was promoted to my second star there. Oh, nice. So I really um, 
learn very, very quickly, but more importantly, it was um, so many just phenomenal men and women who made hard and complex work looks and feel easy, but it certainly was not. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other words of wisdom or advice that you'd like to share <laughs> among your notes of things you want to be sure to, to yeah. pass along? Cause, well, because that's important. Sure. I uh, I'm just excited uh, to be at uh, Virginia Military Institute for now. What is my second visit here? And anytime I have the opportunity to be among young people, it's always fun. I would tell you uh, and leave them with the thought that um, life. Uh, can, is about twists and turns. Uh, I think it's attitudinally, um, to, I, that's why I think to keep a positive attitude is always uh, a good thing. And I think that'll take us all one half the distance. And just to know that uh, you're gonna have your share of challenges, but I have found in, in over 38 years of my military service that by far the opportunities far extended the challenges that I had. I grew from the challenges, uh, but I was uh, very humbled and grateful and excited all at the same time to try to make a positive difference in the lives of people uh, who I was um, affiliated with. And uh, looking back, if I had to do anything different, I would say Never say four years and not a day longer. <laughs> I would say uh, stick with it and see where life takes you in that journey. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would say you're definitely a living example of your audio matching your video. <laughs> thank you. And I've enjoyed our conversation, and thank you so much for your time with us today. Thank you, Catherine. It's my pleasure. On behalf of the VMI Center for Leadership and Ethics, we thank the following. Mr. Caleb Minus, VMI Class of 2020, for the intro and backing music. Find more of his musical stylings on his Instagram page, at Minus Official. That's at M-Y-N-U-S Official. Colonel Dave Gray, Ph.D., U.S. Army Retired, Director of the VMI Center for Leadership and Ethics. And of course, as always, our podcast guests. Find this podcast and other CLE programming information on the VMI Center for Leadership and Ethics website, vmi.edu forward slash CLE. Follow the VMI Center for Leadership and Ethics on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram accounts. The VMI Center for Leadership and Ethics educates, engages, and inspires the VMI Corps of Cadets, VMI staff, faculty, and alumni, and listeners like you. Thanks for tuning in.